Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce Pablo Bronstein and our Q&A host, Ian Altavir. Pablo is a London-based artist whose work's been included in exhibitions around the world, including the Tate Triennial in uh, 2006 in London, uh, at Performa 07 in, right here in New York. He's had solo exhibitions in Munich and in London, and this is his first solo exhibition in New York City. Uh, Bronstein has an MA in Visual Arts from Goldsmiths University of London and a BA from the Slade School of Fine Arts University College London. Ian is a research associate here at the Met in 19th century modern and contemporary art. He's been with us for three and a half years, and uh, most recently he's assisted on the planning and installation of the exhibitions uh, Jasper Johns Gray and uh, Francis Bacon, A Centenary Retrospective. Ian has completed his qualifying exams uh, for a PhD in the history of art at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts in 2006, and is currently writing his dissertation on art in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Uh, he is also a critic at Yale School of Art, where he teaches critical practice. Just to let you know, this event is being videotaped, so if you could turn off your cell phones now, that'd be great. And uh, please give Ian and Pablo a warm welcome as we hand it over to them. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? It works. Does it work? Thanks, Tom, for that lovely um, introduction. And welcome, everyone, to our first event. We're really, really lucky to have Pablo here with us. Um, he's been in town um, installing his exhibition here, and um, it looks to be a fantastic show. It opens officially to the public on Tuesday. And um, I thought that it would be a nice opportunity for everyone to get a nice idea of, the back of Pablo's background and what his work um, has looked like up until now. And um, so I just wanted to start really by asking the, the most basic of questions about how you kind of got involved with art and um, how that all started. Um, <laughs> uh, did you mean what my educational background? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 so we heard about, you know, um, we heard about Slade and Goldsmiths. And yeah. so I assume well, at Slade, you, so even in your undergrad years, you were interested in art making and uh, know, specifically to art school. Well, uh, art education in England is already streamed. So in undergraduate, you're already studying um, visual arts full time. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, it was only when I left Goldsmiths, my MA course, that I really realized what kind of art I wanted to make and how I wanted to make it and how I wanted to exist within the art world, I think. I, I was kind of clueless while I was doing my so MA. So art school didn't necessarily teach you how to be an artist professionally, so to speak. Um, it tried to. It's just <laughs> not very good at it. <laughs> um, I'll, let's take a peek at this. Um, work here, and this is, I think, a great example of um, of your work. It shows um, your interest in architecture, number one, and it also shows your your very fine draftsmanship, and I, among other things. And I just wonder, um, can you tell us um, about what about your interest in architecture too, and how that may have come about? Yeah, I mean, I I sort of be disingenuous if I if I didn't admit that I've always loved it, you know, and I've always been making drawings about buildings and drawing buildings. I mean, there's something really compulsive about, about it that I can't deny. I think leaving grad school, I, I managed to find a discourse around the stuff that I happened to be doing. So I managed to sort of package it up for the real world rather than it existing in my sort of bedroom musings. Um, but basically this drawing, I, I, I guess, W we're including it because it, it sums up a little bit about my interest in, in buildings in that they are um, really uh, expressive of how we organize ourselves and how um, we um, manipulate power through architecture, how we're governed by buildings as well as how we organize ourselves. And so um, with this, we have a sort of play of um, of, of styles. We've got different sorts of um, architectures offsetting. We've got a kind of very modernistic, minimal um, interjection um, in, into the top, a kind of 
um, by modern, I don't mean capital M modern, I mean a kind of contemporary insertion um, in a very, very monumental Baroque style building. So there's two sorts of um, bits of buildings that are kind of antagonistic to each other. There's various impossible things to do with the building, like, for example, there are very large areas of this very Baroque structure um, seen from above that, of course, would need um, uh, artificial illumination because you would not be able to have, unless you had very large light wells, you wouldn't be able to really exist. They'd just be dark and unilluminated. Um, and, um, and the drawing in incorporating old uh, techniques of draftsmanship is also a little bit about role playing in relation to drawing. So it's a little bit about how I pretend to be an architect from a different past, from a different time, and draw in that in that capacity. Were you looking at a specific building in, in thinking of this work, a specific facade that you sketched from, or is it more um, imaginary, let's say? Well, it, it's imaginary in the sense that n neither the facade nor this structure exists even remotely, but the, the, the bottom facade is in the style of, of kind of uh, Baroque, high, high power Baroque buildings like these Bourbon colossal palaces in southern Italy and so on. So, so in a sense, power in the sense that they are, in this case, very brutal examples of authoritarian, um, absolutist architecture. Makes me think of those big palazzi with the rusticated stone, these massive blocks that, um, that instantly tell you from the outside that um, it's impenetrable, basically. Yes. Solid, mm -hmm. there forever. Exactly. The nice thing about... Um, architecture with ornament on it. I mean, all architecture is ornament, but uh, is ornamented. But the nice thing about looking at ornament is that it tells us not only about um, what the building is, is, um, is you know, um, made of and what the, what the building um, looks like, but also what the building wants us to uh, see it as. So very often with, with Baroque architecture, it's really sham, you know, it, it speaks of, of grandness, but actually it's you know, and the same thing could be applied to, to modern buildings, to, to this, you know, these this kind of fake wood covering and, you know, the it's sorts real. of things that we... Real. <laughs> it's totally real. <laughs> <laughs> real in the street sense. Or yeah. in the <laughs> I think it's real wood. No, but that's not, <laughs> but that's not the case for all walls in, in this museum, obviously. No, I'm no absolutely. <laughs> the rest is genuine. <laughs> um, let's take a peek at... Um, this is a, 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 a an earlier show of yours. And while that large-scale drawing on the left I know is not by you, um, the sort of molding at the bottom is. Um, can you describe what's yes. going on? Um, <coughs> this is, this is a, um, uh, it's called Model for a Public Square. It's from 2004, I think. Um, and, and it's basically a very low wall in um, this kind of postmodern color with these um, symbols of, the city as conceived by postmodern architects in the 1980s and 70s. And so what this does is um, sit in the gal gallery floor. It's basically a square. Uh, uh, this, this, um, um, sorry, I've just gotten back. Oh, I see, so you can, walk, you can walk around the outside of it as well as. Exactly. Well, basi <coughs> basically what happens is that it's a very low wall. And so um, the public does not walk into it because of the gallery convention of leaving it open. Uh, and so you sort of visualize the public square and during the course of the exhibition, the exhibition gets very crowded as a result of pushing people to these sides. And so you sort of visualize space, and it's preserved through a con convention. And, and you see, I think, somewhat postmodernist architecture, that, the, that sort of popular building style from the 70s and 80s, as controlling people's space as well. Exactly. Right? I mean, the, the, the political motivation for this work is that um, postmodern architecture is, is really quite clever in taking public space away from the public. Um, it, it presents a, an aesthetic of public space, i.e. it talks about piazzas and the classical language associated with freedom and democracy, um, but it, in a sense, is used to subtly bring in uh, retail space and to um, sell off public land as a result. And so very often, at least it's the case that happens in England, um, genuine government land is sold off uh, and it is then uh, replaced by something that looks very public and has trees and benches and classical columns and people looking like they're Roman senators in the 
presentation drawings, you know, wandering around saying, isn't this wonderful how, how, you know, how public it is, but actually it belongs to a corporation. I, I, you send, you'd see this, these places in New York too, I think, and, and I notice from time to time on the sidewalk, there's little plaques that say, that basically tell you the limits of the property and, and say that, the, that whoever owns that building can basically eject you from that space. Absolutely. So obviously it's not public. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, corporations are, are sort of legally obliged to, um, to, to put publicly usable spaces, but you can get very forcefully ejected. And also, within 20 years' time, they may not have to um, have benches and trees on them. You describe um, a lot of these buildings um, in London in this fantastic little book. Fifteen ninety nine. <laughs> Actually, cost me more than that. No, really. Yeah, I didn't get that discount. No. <laughs> How much did you pay for it? Um, I think twenty three. I know, scandalous. <laughs> Should I call Walter about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's great. It's a great book, um, and includes many many drawings by Pablo about uh, sort of a survey, almost like a nineteenth century Bedeker guide to postmodern architecture in London. Um, and this is an example. Although this is the actual drawing, right? I framed up for 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 the gallery, maybe. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this isn't the way they appear in the book. In the book, they're really like uh, kind of nineteenth-century illustrations, um, and they're just part of the text. They go along with the text describing the drawings. Um, we'll move forward. Um, so these buildings are all, all exist, and, and and the and the book really sort of charts the rise and tail end of postmodernism. So that's the so it's it's, a, it's the Four Seasons, I think, hotel. Uh, it is. In, it is. Um, in Canary Wharf in this kind of pharaonic style. I think it's from 2004 or something like that. That's really the sort of end point of this kind of high, high level POMO. And you describe the way in which this style of architecture and its, and its, um, and its architects sort of make pastiches in a way of various, um, various styles. So using the vocabulary of the Baroque, using the vocabulary of the neoclassical, even as you say, pharaonic Egyptian architecture, um, in order, I think you say, as uh, uh, on the one hand, to separate themselves from the sort of clean box um, Bauhaus legacy of uh, glass and steel of the 50s and 60s, and also the concrete brutalist sort of things. Yes, I mean, I think the history of postmodernism is incredibly complicated, and there were people, there were Italians in the 1930s that were doing proto-postmodernistic um, things with their buildings, people like um, Gio Ponti and um, Libero and so on, doing very interesting things. Um, <coughs> but I think that the important thing about the postmodern architecture that I'm interested in the, in this book is that it's architecture of development, ultimately. It's really architecture that's about creating as much easy differentiation between it and a neighboring building as it possibly can happen so that something like two office buildings can go up with steel frames and one of them will be Egyptian and one of them will be, um, I don't know, uh, Taj Mahal. And it will, you know, for, for very little money you have an enormous difference in the signifier. And, and, what's, and what's also interesting about that stuff is that it's a language, it's a technique learned from advertising, um, which is very important, you know. So, um can you can you describe that a little more about uh, advertising? You mean this this sort of pastiching is a way to signify something? Well, I mean, <coughs> pastiching happens in in modern buildings. I mean, e every sort of steel and glass building that goes up now is referencing high modernity. Um, but I, I think that the the cheap and cheerful differentiations that say these sorts of buildings can produce is something that has then taught us how to really fine tune and tailor make differentiations between buildings, and often on the cheap as well. Oh, absolutely! Tying back into the, the sort of fake wood thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a lot cheaper to build something that looks like the Taj Mahal than it is to build something that is, you know, has design integrity, whatever that that might mean. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, you say the book's been selling very well. Yeah, it's been doing all right. <laughs> because, I mean, to be honest, my books get miscategorized because mm -hmm. I'm fairly crossover in my practice. And so the books have been being miscategorized in bookshops, and they tend to end up in either 
the uh, guide section or the interior decoration section, which sell, obviously, art publishing doesn't sell. It's like pissing money up the wall. And so this <laughs> is like, you know, this is, it's good to get into other shelves. <laughs> it is, it is. And, and I think maybe that has, says something, too, about, about the style that you use, per se. I mean, you mentioned this kind of, uh, um, I don't want to say traditional, but I mean, the, the idea of creating almost a 19th century Bedeker or something like that is, in a way, using um, an outdated sort of motif um, to your own ends. And I think that, that is a, a, that's a very seductive way, in a way, to go about it. But do, do, do you run across people saying, asking you about your traditional technique and things like that? Um, I mean, traditional is, is a kind of complicated word, really, because in order for something to be traditional, um, there needs to be an ongoing tradition of it. Um, and, and there isn't a tradition of 18th century style architectural draftsmanship. Um, and so it's a fabrication, it's a pastiche, as it were. But um, I, I, I do get, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that, that they can be pretty things. And so, yes, they, they might fall into, into being called sort of conservative, decorative, whatever it might be. Um, let's look at this, which is which is sort of very Piranesi esque almost. No, or mm. this is a this is a really large drawing in in ink. It's about two and a half meters high, <coughs> and um, and basically what this is, is is a sort of mythical retelling of the construction of one of the most important postmodern uh, set pieces in London. This um, this sort of stage set piazza which is really quite incredible. It's basically like it's been vacuum molded in this kind of cheap reconstituted stone to imitate uh, whatever um, Baroque buildings, or, uh, sort of Baroque but cheapo Baroque um, with these bits and pieces of, of terracotta tiling. Uh, it's a bit of a mess, but um, it's a hugely controversial space and Prince Charles got involved and it was a real mess. Um, where is it? It's where the stock exchange is in London now. Yeah. It's called Paternoster Square. Yeah. And so, um, what this um, column erection represents, apart from the kind of phallic implications of that, there's, there's this, there is literally a column like this um, I in the middle of the square. I I it's a kind of myth mythological telling of how this square was constructed and put together. And it's, a, it's something that the, these architectures try to instill in, in the viewer of those, of those buildings. So for example, um, the um, column is probably literally molded and poured into it. Um, and if not, it was brought in in like one centimeter cubes. But the, the image that it creates is one of timeless dignity and adherence to traditional techniques and so on. Um, I'm going to, well, it's funny too. I mean, so, so the mythical construction, um, the sort of uh, funny, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? These sort of architectural controversies, I mean, are something I think New Yorkers are familiar with too, in terms of what's happening at Ground Zero, for example. And again, this idea of a highly mediated public space, I think, is quite, um, quite timely. Um, you also, um, oh, and here's another example of this. Yes, this is, th they've <coughs> basically, Prince Charles complained about this. Um, this arch that was kind of in storage somewhere, it was literally crated up, um, that had been removed from a street in London when they cleared it in the 1970s or something. <laughs> Sorry. And, um, uh, and they sort of dunked it there. I mean, they must have literally sprayed it on. I don't know how they got this building where it was, but I mean, they certainly didn't drag it with horses. But the idea is of this kind of, you know, whatever this moment of architectural drama in the city. And you also um, are known for staging performances. Um, this one, for example, at um, in in the Great Hall in Tate Britain. And can you describe? Yes. How well, you about that? well, the, the Tate um, asked me to create a lobby for them for this exhibition um, uh, in 2006, and they they said, "Oh, you can do this or that." But then they started overloading it with stuff the way that exhibitions tend to when they're in sort of s sort of key navigational points. So you have to have information, you have to have 
cafe, you have to have catalog sales, you have to have all these things. And so I created a grid on the floor. It was a kind of institutional critique device. And I said, nothing happens inside this. It's an empty tabula rasa signifier of public space. And so it stuff, sales, coffee can happen around it, but this is empty. Um, and so I designed these sort of postmodern additions in the style of James Sterling, who's a famous postmodern architect of the 1980s. So you see that triangle door um, in the background. Um, and, and then uh, the, the tower on the right-hand side is, is um, a collaboration uh, also with, um, with an architect, uh, Celine Condrelli. Um, <coughs> and, I, and I designed um, uh, this, sorry, the grid in, in lime green, which is a color that, it, that was used very much to sort of sell the Tate uh, sell a remodeling of the Tate in the 1980s. And so these figures are like um, activators in that public space. They're like a personification of the citizen within this piazza somehow. They're kind of ideal. And they're in various different movements. They're, um, the, the girl in front is, um, it's right, we can pan, is, is doing a kind of Baroque uh, style of, of elegant dancing while she while she moves. I can do a little demonstration of what sprezzatura is if you if you're interested. Um, yes. Uh, so, ba <laughs> so, ba so basically, she's moving in this way that that, that is about um, effortless elegance, um, and uh, sprezzatura is a, is a way of of codifying um, the the body language in order to reflect its um, aristocratic superiority. Um, and so it was very much in vogue during um, the uh, Italian Renaissance where it was really coined. Um, and it became a way of social functioning. And then later on, it got sort of concealed and congealed within the world of ballet, so, or for example, camp behavior also. Um, but for example, um, if, if I were holding um, this, this beer, like for example, uh, this would be Sprezzatura. But this wouldn't be <laughs> Sprezzatura, if that makes sense. Um, and so uh, one of the dancers was doing this kind of elegant, perfect Sprezzatura pose. And then the others did uh, various modernistic reinterpretations of that to the point that it got absolutely reduced to this horrendous kind of cube dance. I don't know what the work was really about. <laughs> There's another example. And this is another uh, one of these installations with performance. Yes, well, this is a video installation. And, um, uh, and it's a video still of, of this space that I designed in collaboration with an architect, Etienne Declou. Um, and the, the architecture is this kind of very reduced um, version of the stuff that you find in Paternoster Square, this postmodern square that I talked about earlier. And so these dancers are also kind of choreographing and creating a kind of architectural walk through the space in this kind of sprezzatura style. And the costumes are meant to be sort of 80s-ish or something? Yeah, I mean, the, the costumes are these kinds of, uh, uh, is just the most postmodern color I could find. <laughs> <laughs> and and this, this took place in Performer 07. Um, ignore the sweat patch underneath her arm. Um, Basically, um, this was this is the most public space I've ever used, and it's really interesting that it's in a private bank building. It's really quite amazing. You, you guys, I think, it's near Wall Street. Yeah. yeah, it's in Wall Street, and you, you guys have this rule, I think, where whereby if you if you dedicate your ground floor to the public, you can build your buildings higher, I believe, right? Um, and so we sort of laid these grids out, and then they performed this kind of abstracted. Um, spectacle of sprezzatura elegance. So it was a kind of contrast of, of body languages. Um, the, I the idea behind uh, this work, really, if I have to kind of try to reduce it as much as I can, um, would be that um, walking in a pedestrian way, whatever we call that, is as much a language as an elegant way of walking or a sprezzatura way of walking or whatever other way of walking. So for example, a, a regular walk, when you see it in a theatre space, is already theatrical. And and when one is in public too, on the street. Absolutely, yes. Public. I mean, I in a sense, that that note of n sort of highlighting that becomes a little bit confrontational, which I'm not so keen on. So at the moment, I'm moving more towards really organised stage works. I think. So 
Should we move on? Yeah. Let's talk about um, your use of, of actual antique objects. And I'm sort of fascinated um, here, uh, a drawing by you on the wall, along with um, these, these sort of sought out, carefully sought out and, and bought antique clocks, or there's a close up of the drawing, or uh, sort of a contrast between uh, like a, a, an 18th century painting you've, you've actually bought at auction and a drawing of yours on the left. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that kind of conjunction and, and your participation too in that market. Yes, well, I mean, uh, se several things here that you're, that you're drawing on. I mean, one of the things that I, I find fascinating is just how um, undervalued the antiques market is, so much so that I can incorporate a 17th century uh, painting, really good quality 17th century painting that is actually signed and dated and attributable um, within my production values. Um, and, and, and that's a really unique situation at the moment that we're experiencing. The same with those really sophisticated clocks from 200 years ago. They look like they are incredibly valuable pieces. They do. They're fantastic. Um, and so that the kind of disjunction with the, um, with the art fair or with the commercial gallery showing contemporary art is something that I want to sort of highlight. Um, but the um, th th these two works are very different. They, they both do other things. So, for example, this one is called Horological Promenade, and there are these two clocks that um, are, are about different markets, and, and uh, they're also about performance because they're spaced uh, away from each other, and you walk from one to the other, and that is registered in the passing of the time. It's a kind of cocktail-ish, metaphysical load of bullshit. I mean, fun bullshit, but it's <laughs> like a kind of gag in a way. It's like it's so goofy, but paired with the fact that these clocks are so rare and fancy, it's a kind of odd moment of performance when you're witnessing this piece of work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the drawing is a kind of contract. It tells the person that buys this um, how to install the work. And it also highlights the fact that the drawing is within um, my production somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the painting is, is, a, is a game of scales. So the painting on the right-hand side is um, uh, really quite large, and in the drawing on the left underneath, it's portrayed as very, very little. And so really what we have on the left is instructions for hanging this work. You're supposed to construct this enormous doorway and then have this <laughs> drawing, this painting highlighted within that. And uh <laughs> so actually build, build that molding. That that yeah, why not? <laughs> and you do um, more and more and more use actual architectural sort of fragments or fake architectural fragments or real ones in in the gallery space. So here's an example. Yes, a Corinthian column. Th this this is really aimed at my sort of real irritation in the sort of seamless uh, white wall. Um, and so uh, my I think my my my. The thing that sort of really ticks me off is, is how um, art fairs that could look one way or another or this way or that follow the, of course they have to paint their walls white because people want to see the work, but um, I, in a way I, I, I'm, I guess with this work I'm trying to draw attention to what the whiteness in, in the gallery may signify. So in this case it comes from a classical lineage that has to do with uh, purity, cleanliness, distance, and uh, whatever, intellectuality, reason. Sort of uh, Winkelmann, 18th, exactly. 18th century, 19th exactly. century thing. But in this case, it's a plastic column that you can buy for you know, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and there's another view. Yeah, it's, it's called, the piece is called Tragic Column, and, um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's sad, sad piece. <laughs> <laughs> that monkey's not yours, the chimpanzee. Yeah, the, no. the, the rest of the work is, is, art, is art fair. Aha. Uh -huh. And this was a, a folly I designed um, for a, a farm architecture crossover thingy in the Lake District. Um, it's for chickens and various other bits and pieces. <laughs> but it's, it's the first example of pioneering low-end, high-aspiration post-modernity in the Lake District, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, another book project in publisher, my favorite. Um, and um, about about framing, and this is so funny because we I just showed you that book upstairs in the office that 
one of our curators uh, pulled from the library, which was about all those curtains. There's, um, but this this is about uh, doorways. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of um, it's a kind of uh, manual on um, on acquiring different aesthetic for your white wall aperture. So if we could go to the, for example, uh, all, all the doors are exactly the same. They're, they're literal cutouts in a white wall. And so these are proposals on how to decorate. It's like a kind of plate book that you would get in the 18th century. And so you get different sorts of ideas for things. This is the jardinier. And there's, you know, there's different things you can do to your doorway. <laughs> the ruin. So we're on to the show, right? But I guess we could go off and see it. Instead. Yeah, so we, we have a, uh, a great surprise, and that is that um, Pablo's finished installing, and the painters were just up there. Um, the gallery is actually closed to the public, but um, I think that we will have time, maybe after about, uh, let, let's see. What, what I think we should do is, um, if uh, do you want to? Yeah, I can ask I can take maybe one or two questions. Um, we can end this and have some beer, uh, generously provided by Harpoon. Pablo's been enjoying it. Yeah, it's good. It's kind if of. If I had more hands, I would have some too. But fancy <laughs> beer. Yes, fancy yeah. beer. Um, again, thank you, Harpoon. Uh, we're very grateful. Um, so let's. Um, we're, we'll do some questions. Uh, anybody? Um, I'm going to bring a mic to you. Does anybody have a question? Ah, Marcy. I'm coming over. Thank you. I very much appreciated that talk. Um, and I couldn't help but wonder in all of your talk about um, architecture and power and the relationships, um, if you see any connection between your work and Britain's colonial history, and if so, how that connects with uh, your interest in postmodernism. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite a, a big question. Um, I, I am interested in it. And you will see upstairs in the exhibition, there's a particular work that is about the Temple of Dunder here. and. Um, even though, in fact, it was probably flown over in sachet form and refizzed up with some kind of goo here in the 1960s, um, <laughs> it, it, the the large objects in British and French and Italian German museums were literally dragged over stone by stone by, you know, from the countries that they were occupying at the time. And in a sense, the fact that America has all of these really fabulous objects deposited in the museum speaks of its own colonial. Supremacy, it's an economic one, but this is, you know. Um, but so, so I'm interested in that, but I, I, I try desperately to avoid direct anger finger, uh, finger pointing because, in a sense, uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm really interested in how these things are reflected within architecture. So I, I think, um, I, think I, I really have to limit myself and the project to that. Um, but I, I look more at the way that buildings are put together and um, portrayed in history rather than analyzing individual decorative components that much. So I'm not so much interested in, for example, the way that, um, say, Africa, the continent, is portrayed in a Victorian building uh, as much as I am the fact that um, a sweatshop is formed in a particular way, for example. Uh, any more questions? Um, I, th I think um, uh, ultimately I'm, a, I'm a, a probably a bit of an interior decorator at heart, you know. <coughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not really that political at all. Uh, and so politics kind of informs what I'm interested in a little bit, but um, I, I'm interested in this territory because I like it. I like the way it looks. And so I play around with it and I end up discovering that you know, the moment, well, whenever you stare at something for long enough, you start seeing how it's put together. And so that's sort of what's, what's been happening. But my initial interest in this is absolutely that I love columns and capitals and obelisks and things like that. Um, you see an image here uh, from the show upstairs. And um, again, this sort of imaginary, um, imag I'll say imagining how the Met itself is constructed. And I think implied in that too, though, is 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 this muse museological sorry this was off <laughs> museological kind of um, process, 
And I asked you earlier um, whether you had any favorite uh, galleries when while you were here on your visit and had spent some time in, in this this whole week in the museum. Yeah. And you mentioned just um, well, well, you could say it too. I well, thought. yeah. I mean, I I really like the the layering of period rooms that you get here. So you get this sort of tunnel of history with these sort of recreations of 18th, 19th, uh, you know, 17th century rooms, one after the other. I mean, in a sense, like, um, museums have a, a important function in telling us how to decorate, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Pablo, for talking with us. And um, it is now 25 after. I think at 7.45, those of you who want to come up and see the galleries, we will escort you. So we'll meet sort of by the entrance where you signed in. Um, in the meantime, we'll get beer. You could um, mingle and ask Pablo questions one-on-one. -on -one. And um, thanks again for coming. <laughs>